On leaving the old nest, the swarm normally flies only a few meters and settles. Scout bees look for a suitable place to start the new colony. Eventually, one location wins favor and the whole swarm takes to the air. Bees of the world. Chapter 2. The policeman driving us to jail was Mr. Avery Gaston, but the men at the Esso station called him Shoe. A puzzling nickname, since there was nothing remarkable about his shoes, or even his feet so far as I could see. The one thing about him was the smallness of his ears, the ears of a child. Ears like dry, little dried apricots. I fixed my eyes on them from the back seat and wondered why he wasn't called ears. The three men followed us in a green pickup with a gun rack inside. They drove close to our bumper and blew the horn every few seconds. I jumped each time, and Rosaline gave my leg a pat. In front of the Western Auto, the men started a game of pulling alongside us and yelling things out the window, mostly things we couldn't make out because our windows were rolled up. People in the back of police cars were not given the benefit of door handles or window cranks, I noticed. So we were blessed to be chauffeured to jail in smothering heat, watching the men mouth things we were glad not to know. Rosalind looked straight ahead and acted as if the men were insignificant houseflies buzzing at our screen door. I was the only one who could feel the way her thighs trembled, the whole back seat like a vibrating bed. Mr. Gaston, I said, those men aren't coming with us, are they? His smile appeared in the rearview mirror. I can't say what men riled up like that will do. Before Main Street, they tired of the amusement and sped off. I breathed easier, but when we pulled into the empty lot behind the police station, they were waiting on the back step. The dealer taped a flashlight, tapped a flashlight against the palm of his hand. The other two held our church fans, waving them back and forth. When we got out of the car, Mr. Gaston put handcuffs on Rosaline, fastening her arms behind her back. I walked so close to her, I felt heat vapor trailing off her skin. She stopped ten yards short of the men and refused to budge. Now look here, don't make me get out my gun, Mr. Gaston said. Usually the only time the police and Sylvan got to use their guns was when they got called out to shoot rattlesnakes in people's yards. Come on, Rosaline, I said. What can they do to you with the policemen right here? That was when the dealer lifted the flashlight over his head, then down, smashing it into Rosaline's forehead. She dropped to her knees. I don't remember screaming, but the next thing I knew, Mr. Gaston had his hand clamped over my mouth. Hush, he said. Maybe now you feel like apologizing, the dealer said. Rosaline tried to get to her feet, but without her hands, it was hopeless. It took me and Mr. Gaston both to pull her up. Your black ass is going to apologize one way or another, the dealer said, and he stepped towards Rosalie. Hold on now, Franklin, Mr. Gaston said, moving us towards the door. Now's not the time. I'm not resting till she apologizes. That's the last I heard him yell before we got inside where I had an overpowering impulse to kneel down and kiss the jailhouse floor. The only image I had for jails was from the westerns at the movies, and this one was nothing like that. For one thing, it was painted pink and had flower print curtains in the window. It turned out we'd come in through the jailer's living quarters. His wife stepped in from the kitchen, greasing a muffin tin. Got you two more mouths to feed. Mr. Gaston said, and she went back to work without a smile of sympathy. He led us around to the front, where there were two rows of jail cells, all of them empty. Mr. Gaston removed Rosaline's handcuffs and handed her a towel from the bathroom. She pressed it against her head while he filled out papers at the desk, followed by a period of poking around for keys in a file drawer. The jail cells smelled with the breath of drunk people. He put us in the first cell on the first row, where somebody had scratched the words shit thrown across a bench attached to one wall. Nothing seemed quite real. We're in jail, I thought. We're in jail. When Rosaline pulled back the towel, 
I saw an inch-long gash across a puffy place high over her eyebrow. Is it hurting bad? I asked. Some, she said. She circled the cell two or three times before sinking down onto the bench. T-Ray will get us out, I said. Uh-huh. She didn't speak another word till Mr. Gaston opened the cell door about half an hour later. Come on, he said. Rosaline looked hopeful for a moment. She actually started to lift herself. He shook his head. You ain't going anywhere, just the girl. At the door, I held onto the cell bar like it was a long bone on Ros in Rosaline's arm. I'll be back. All right? All right, Rosaline? You go on. I'll manage. The caved-in look on her face nearly did me in. The speedometer needle on T-Ray's truck wiggled so badly I couldn't make out whether it was pointed at 70 or 80. Leaning onto the steering wheel, he jammed his foot onto the accelerator, let off, then jammed it again. The poor truck was rattling to the point I expected the hood to fly off and decapitate a couple of pine trees. I imagined that T-Ray was rushing home so he could start right away constructing a pyramids of grits all through the house, a torture chamber of food staples, where I would go from one pile to the next, kneeling for hours on end with nothing but bathroom breaks. I didn't care. I couldn't think of anything but Rosaline back there in jail. I squinted at him sideways. What about Rosaline? You have to let her out. You're lucky I got you out he yelled. But she can't stay there. She dumped snuff juice on three white men. What the hell was she thinking? And on Franklin Posey, for Christ's sake. You couldn't have picked someone normal? He's the meanest black person hater in Sylvan. He'd as soon kill her as look at her. But not really, I said. You don't mean he would really kill her. What I mean is, I wouldn't be surprised if he flat out killed her. My arms felt weak in their sockets. Franklin Posey was the man with the flashlight, and he was going to kill Rosaline. But then, hadn't I known this inside even before T-Ray ever said it? He followed me up the stairs. I moved with deliberate slowness, anger suddenly building inside me. How could he leave Rosaline in jail like that? As I stepped inside my room, he stopped at the doorway. I have to go settle the payroll for the pickers. He said, don't you leave this room. You understand me? You sit here and think hard about me coming back and dealing with you. Think about it real hard. You don't scare me, I said, mostly under my breath. He'd already turned to leave, but now he whirled back. What did you say? You don't scare me, I repeated, louder this time. A brazen feeling had broken loose in me, a daring something that had been locked up in my chest. He stepped towards me, raising the back of his hand like he might bring it down across my face. You better watch your mouth. Go ahead, try and hit me, I yelled. When he swung, I turned my face. It was a clean miss. I ran for the bed and scrambled onto the middle of it, breathing hard. My mother will never let you touch me again, I shouted. Your mother? His face was bright. You think that goddamn woman gave a shit about you? My mother loved me, I cried. He threw back his head and let out a forced, bitter laugh. It's, it's not funny, I said. He lunged towards the bed then, pressing his fist into the mattress, bringing his face so close I could see the tiny holes where his whiskers grew. I slid backward towards the pillows, shoving my head into the headboard. Not funny, he yelled. Not funny? Why, it's the funniest goddamn thing I ever heard. You thinking your mother is your guardian angel, he laughed again. That woman could have cared less about you. That's not true, I said. It's not. And how would you know, he said, still leaning towards me. A leftover smile pulled the corners of his mouth. I hate you! That stopped his smiling instantly. He stiffened. Why, you little bitch, he said. The color faded from his lips. Suddenly I felt ice cold. 
as if something dangerous had slipped into the room. I looked towards the window and felt a tremor slide along my spine. You listen to me, he said, his voice deadly calm. The truth is, your sorry mother ran off and left you. The day she died, she'd come back to get her things. That's all. You can hate me all you want, but she's the one who left you. The room turned absolutely silent. He brushed at something on his shirt front, then walked to the door. After he left, I didn't move except to trace the bars of light on the bed with my finger. The sound of his boots banging down the stairs drifted away, and I took the pillows from underneath the bedspread and placed them around me like I was making an inner tube that might keep me afloat. I could understand her leaving him, but me? This would sink me forever. The bee jar sat on my bedside table, empty now. Sometime since this morning, the bees had finally gotten around to flying off. I reached over and took the jar in my hands, and out came the tears I'd been holding on to, it seemed like for years. Your sorry mother ran off and left you. The day she died, she'd come back to get her things. That's all. God and Jesus, you make him take it back. The memory settled over me. The suitcase on the floor. The way they fought. My shoulders began to shake in a strange, uncontrollable way. I held the jar pressed between my breasts, hoping it would steady me. But I couldn't stop shaking, couldn't stop crying. And it frightened me, as though I'd been struck by a car I hadn't seen coming and was lying on the side of the road, trying to understand what had happened. I sat on the edge of the bed, replaying his words over and over. Each time, there was a wrench in what felt like my heart. I don't know how long I sat there, feeling broken to pieces. Finally, I walked to the window and gazed out at the peach trees, stretching halfway to North Carolina the way they held up their leafy arms in gestures of pure beseeching. The rest was sky and air and lonely space. I looked down at the bee jar still clutched in my hand and saw a teaspoon of teardrops floating in the bottom. I unfastened the window screen and poured it out. The wind lifted it on her skirt tails and shook it over the blistered grass. How could she have left me? I stood there several minutes looking out at the world, trying to understand. Little birds were singing, so perfect. That's when it came to me. What if my mother wasn't, what if my mother leaving wasn't true? What if T-Ray had made it up to punish me? I felt almost dizzy with relief. That was it. That had to be it. I mean, my father was Thomas Edison when it came to inventing punishments. Once after I'd back talked him, he told me my rabbit, Mademoiselle, had died, and I'd cried all night before I discovered her the next morning, healthy as anything in her pen. He had to be making this up, too. Some things were not possible in this world. Children did not have two parents who refused to love them. One, maybe, but for pity's sake, not two. It had to be like he'd said before. She was cleaning out the closet the day of the accident. People cleaned out closets all the time. I took a breath to steady myself. You could say I'd never had a true religious moment, the kind where you know yourself spoken to by a voice that seems other than yourself, spoken to so genuinely, you see the words shining on trees and clouds. But I had such a moment right then, standing in my own ordinary room. I heard a voice say, Lily Melissa Owens, your jar is open. In a matter of seconds, I knew exactly what I had to do. Leave. I had to get away from T-Ray, who was probably on his way back this minute to do Lord knows what to me. Not to mention I had to get Rosaline out of jail. The clock read 2.40. I needed a solid plan, but I didn't have the luxury of sitting down to think one up. I grabbed my pink canvas duffel bag, the one I'd planned to use for overnights the minute anyone asked me. I took the $38 I'd earned selling peaches, and stuffed it into the bag with my seven best pairs of panties, the one that had the days of the week printed across the backside. I dumped in socks, five pairs of shorts, tops, a nightgown, shampoo, brush, toothpaste, toothbrush, rubber bands for my hair, 
all the time watching the window. What else? Catching sight of the map tacked on the wall, I snatched it down, not bothering to pry out the tacks. I reached under the mattress and pulled out my mother's picture, the gloves, and the wooden picture of Black Mary, and tucked them down in the bed, too. Tearing a sheet of paper from last year's English notebook, I wrote a note, short and to the point. Dear T. Ray, don't bother looking for me. Lily. P.S. People who tell lies like you should rot in hell. When I checked the window, T. Ray was coming out the orchard towards the house, fist balled, head plowed forward like a bull wanting to gore something. I propped the note on my dresser and stood a moment in the center of the room, wondering if I'd ever see it again. Goodbye, I said. There was a tiny sprig of sadness pushing up from my heart. Outside, I spied the broken space in the latticework that wrapped around the foundation of the house. Squeezing through, I disappeared into violet light and cobwebbed air. T-Ray's boots stomped across the porch. Lily! Lily! I heard his voice sailing along the floorboards of the house. All of a sudden, I caught sight of Snout sniffing at the spot where I'd called through. I backed deeper into the darkness, but she'd caught my scent and started barking her mangy head off. D-Ray emerged with my note crumpled in his hand, yelled at Snout to shut the hell up, and tore out in his truck, leaving plumes of exhaust all along the driveway. Walking along the weedy strip beside the highway for the second time that day, I was thinking how much older 14 had made me. In the space of a few hours, I'd become 40 years old. The road stretched empty as far as I could see, with heat shimmer making the air seem wavy in places. If I managed to get Rosaline free, and if so big I could have been planet Jupiter, just where did I think we'd go? Suddenly I stood still. Tiburon, South Carolina. Of course, the town written on the back of the Black Mary picture. Hadn't I been planning on going there one of these days? It made such perfect sense. My mother had been there, or else she knew people there who'd cared enough to send her a nice picture of Jesus's mother. And whoever would think to look for us there? I squatted beside the ditch and unfolded the map. Tiburon was a pencil dot beside the big red star of Columbia. T-Ray would check the bus station so Rosaline and I would have to hitchhike. How hard could that be? You stand there with your thumb out and a person takes pity on you. A short distance past the church, Brother Gerald whizzed by in his white Ford. I saw his brake lights flicker. He backed up. I thought that was you, he said through the window. Where are you headed? Town. Again? What's the bag for? I'm, I'm taking some things to Rosaline. She's in jail. Yeah, I know, he said, flinging open the passenger door. Get in, I'm headed there myself. I'd never been inside a preacher's car before. It's not that I expected a ton of Bibles stacked on the back seat, but I was surprised to see that inside, it was like anybody else's car. You're going to see Rosaline, he said. The police called and asked me to press charges against her for stealing church property. They said she took some of our fans. You know anything about that? It was only two fans. He jumped straight into his pulpit voice. In the eyes of God, it doesn't matter whether it's two fans or two hundreds. Stealing is stealing. She asked if she could take the fans. I said no, in plain English. She took them anyways. Now that's sin, Lily. Pious people have always gotten on my nerves. But she's deaf in one ear, I said. I think she just mixed up what you said. She's always doing that. T-Ray will tell her, iron my two shirts and she'll iron the blue shirts a hearing problem well i didn't know that he said rosaline would never steal a thing they said she'd assaulted some men at the esso station it wasn't like that i see it said see she was singing her favorite hymn where were you when they crucified my lord i don't believe those men are christians brother gerald because they yelled at her to shut up with that blankety blank jesus tune Rosaline said, you can curse me, but don't blaspheme the Lord Jesus. But they kept right on. So she poured the juice from her snuff cup on her shoes. Maybe she was wrong, but in her mind, she was standing up for Jesus. I was sweating through my top and all along the back of my thighs.
Brother Gerald dragged his teeth back and forth across his lip. I could tell he was weighing what I'd said.